Welcome to Sunday School. We're happy that you could join us for another pleasant time in the presence of God. Sister Zalma, will you kindly pray for us, please? Sister Zalma? There we go. Can you hear me? Yes, please. Okay. Dear Father, we thank you this morning for the privilege of being able to meet together here on Zoom for Sunday School class. We pray that you will bless our teacher today, give them a clear understanding, and help us, Lord, to have open hearts to receive your word, and that, Lord, we'll put it to use in our lives for thy glory. We thank you and praise you now and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 It's time for our memory verse drill. Um, Daisy, will you kindly read your memory verse for us? I will trust and not be afraid, for the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. Isaiah chapter 12, verse 2. Amen. God bless you. Um, Josiah, Alice, your way. She and live in life exceeding great reward. Genesis 15 1. Thank you. But uh, Enoch. We can't hear you. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith in this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Romans chapter 5 verses 1 and 2. Bless you, brother. Thank you so much. Um, at this point, I'm going to hand over to our, our pastor, Brother Shopper. Thank, thank, uh, thank you so very much, Sister Han, and all those who recited the key verses. Welcome everyone to our combined Zoom Sunday School class this morning. Special welcome to all who are here from around the world, from our headquarters church in Portland and different places around the world. Thank you all for joining us and may God bless you all. Uh, if you have any prayer requests, you can put those in the chat window uh, in Zoom and we will be sure to harvest those requests and um, forward them to our headquarters church for prayers and uh, also present them before the Lord here. Uh, considering we all want to enjoy the lesson, please kindly mute yourself when you are not talking. Um, we know that many might also want to contribute. Uh, you can raise your hand in Zoom or uh, leave your comments in the chat uh, window. Some people will be there moderating the chat window as usual. Thank you once again for joining us today. We have Another beautiful lesson this morning titled The First Hebrew. Our teacher this morning is Reverend Sam Ajayi from our headquarters church in Portland, Oregon. Um, without any further ado, I would like to hand over to Brother Sam. Brother Sam, over to you, sir. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Thank God for that. Well, yeah, as uh, was said, our lesson this morning is the first Hebrew. And I was wondering, what are you first at? You know, sometimes some people are the first child in the family. I happen to be the only child, so... I guess I'm um, the first and the first and the first as far as my family goes. Some are the first girl or the first boy in the family. Some are the first to graduate high school or the first to graduate college, the first to get married. So well, people have first as some things, but most of these are not very significant. And if they are, they are significant only to the person 
who is forced at whatever they are forced at. But we thank God for Abraham, who was not only just the first Hebrew, but the man that God used to make our life and any man or woman's life to be first here and then to have another life eternally with the Lord. That is part of what Abraham did. Um, Brother Shola, can you, can you hear me? We, we can hear you, sir. Okay, okay. Yes. That's thank, thank you, sir. Okay. So, we are going to go directly to um, the screen. Um, can I get can I get access to a screen share, please? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You you are the co-host, sir. Okay. All right. So Abraham, the first Hebrew. In thinking about uh, Abraham, we'll take our text from Genesis 12, 1 to 3, and it reads, Now the Lord has said unto Abraham, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great. And thou shalt be a blessing, and I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Also, we have Genesis 17, 1 to 8. And when Abraham was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abraham and said unto him, I am the almighty God, walk before me and be thou perfect. And I will make my covenant between me and thee and will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abraham fell on his face and God talked with him saying, as for me, behold, my covenant is with thee and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abraham, but thy name shall be called Abraham, for a father of many nations have I made thee. And I will make thee exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee, and thy seed after thee in their generations for an everlasting covenant, to be a God unto thee, and to thy seed after thee. And I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And the key verse which was recited was taken from Romans 5, 1 to 2. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace, wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Having access by faith into the grace wherein we stand, where you and myself and all Christians all over the world, in all generations, past, present, and future, if the Lord tarries, that access by faith is open to us by Abraham. He was the father of faith. He was the one that God used to give us the path to have that faith. And that is the reason why Abraham was called the father of faith. In talking about Abraham, Two people came to mind. 
One was uh, Reverend Florence Crawford, Sister uh, Florence, who we all know as the founder of our church. Sister Florence has direct influence in bringing about the Apostolic Faith Church headquarters in Portland, Oregon. He has indirect influence in all Apostolic Faith Churches worldwide, in North America, in Africa, in Europe, in Asia, in West Indies, in Australia, and in South America. Everywhere that we have an Apostolic Faith Church or an influence of an Apostolic Faith Church, it was brought about by Sister Florence Crawford. Another person that comes to mind is Reverend Timothy Oshokoya. He was the founder or the leader of the Apostolic Faith Church work in Nigeria and during his time of all Apostolic Faith Churches all over Africa. He has direct influence in Africa, in Nigeria, in Benin Republic, in Cameroon, in Togo, in Ivory Coast, in Burkina Faso, in Niger Republic, in Namibia, in Gabon, in the Demo uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, in Liberia, in Gambia, in Senegal, and also in Southern Africa. He has indirect influence in the US and Canada, Pullman, Washington, Madison, Wisconsin, Oceanside, New York, Boston, Massachusetts, Phoenix, Arizona, Reston, Virginia, Memphis, Tennessee, Toronto, Ontario, Winnipeg, Manitoba, Calgary, Alberta, and Edmonton, Alberta as well. And then the other world locations in the United Kingdom, in France, in Australia, and in South America. These two people that we know of very well, and uh, one that, well, I guess Brother Earl knows Sister Florence, and a number of us know Brother Timothy Oshokoya, they were called, they were chosen. Sister Florence Crawford was an atheist. But when God called her, she left all that. And at the time that God called her, actually, she was in a period when in the United States, for instance, uh, racism was taken as a birthright. But she decided that she was going to mix with people who had the word of God. And she did. She was loving. She spread the gospel to everyone. She mentioned in her testimony that whenever she saw anyone that was poor, she was always crying and asking God to help them to save them. That was the foundation that was laid by her for all the apostolic faith churches worldwide. Brother Timothy Oshokoya, he was a currency counterfeiter. But when God saved her, he changed, God, God saved him, rather, he changed him completely. And in his time, uh, which is still there now, Nigeria had uh, uh, many different sections and a lot of things that were not so good in terms of the relationship was going on. But he brought the people that were under him together. There was no east or south or north or west. Everybody was together under the influence of the power of the faith that is in God. That is what they gave to us. 
So in coming to Abraham, we see that Abraham had some amazing qualities. He laid the foundation of faith. Faith is something that we can call as the foundation, the baseline, the structure, the skeleton, the blueprint of our belief, our trust, our obedience, and our relationship or work with God. That is why God says without faith, it is impossible to please God. We can liken faith to a bookshelf. The bookshelf itself is what the book stands upon. Suppose there is nowhere to store books in the house. It will just scatter somewhere. But on the bookshelf, it is arranged in order. That is exactly what faith looks like. Is that foundation. It is the groundbreaking quality that puts everything together, that holds everything in place. Without faith, it is not possible to even pray for salvation. Without faith, it is impossible to receive it. It is impossible to be sanctified or baptized. It is impossible to, to have the love that God expects. It is impossible to have that brotherly kindness. Impossible to do all of those things. You can look at each one of those books as the item of faith that we have that God requires. That is what Abraham did, being the first Hebrew to show us the way to lay the foundation to be accepted by God. After Adam and Eve made the error, God didn't force Abraham. He didn't precondition him. Abraham chose to obey God. Abraham chose to please God. Abraham chose to believe God and have complete trust and faith in the Lord. So we should thank God for Abraham. I, reading this uh, lesson, I felt I've not really been thanking God for Abraham. He opened the way for us. He opened the way so that the Savior could come to mankind. What an amazing person he was. And all of the things that he went through, that he was diligent. He trusted God implicitly. And that is the man that we're going to study today. So let's go to the questions. The first question says, what were the promises that God made to Abraham and on what were they conditioned? God gave Abraham seven promises. The first one was that I will make of thee a great nation. Two, I will bless thee. Three, I will make thy name great. Four, thou shalt be a blessing. Five, I will bless them that bless thee. Six, I will curse him that curseth thee. And seven, in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. We can categorize these promises as internal, external, and universal blessings. The first four were personal. I will make of thee a great nation. I will bless thee. I will make thy name great. Thou shalt be a blessing. The next two are protective. I will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee. And the last one is universal. In this shall all families of the earth be blessed. So we see that the promises that God gave to Abraham were total. They were complete. They were encompassing. The requirement that God made of Abraham was that he had to leave his country. You know, there are some blessings that we cannot get with the status quo. There are some blessings that, re that requires that we move out. If we're going to be saved, we have to move out of sin to 
confess them and forsake them. That is moving out. And if you want to be sanctified, it entails that we do some further moving out of self. And to be baptized with the Holy Spirit is the same thing. If we want a deeper walk with the Lord, we have to move out of many things. That is what God required of Abraham. And we thank God that Abraham did not fail. He listened and obeyed the Lord, and the Lord blessed him. So we have some other questions that were selected, and uh, some of our uh, brothers and sisters will help us out. And if you have any comment, uh, please let us know. Brother Shola will monitor the uh, duration of hand electronically. And um, each person has been allotted four minutes or less. So we go to question number three. And Sister Zelma of Portland, Oregon will answer the question. The question is, of the seven promises God gave to Abraham, which do you consider to be the most important to us and why? Sister Zelma. Yes. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Genesis 12, 3 says, In thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. That promise is repeated again in Genesis 28, 14. The promise that's repeated again is, is in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Then if you go to Matthew 1, 1, and I'm going to flip to my Bible and read that. The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. So through the lineage of Abraham came King David and eventually came Jesus Christ. And that's how we are recipients of the promise that was given to Abraham. Because now we have a savior that was or, as a result of Abraham's faithfulness and of the promise that was given to him by God. Then it was all the earth shall be blessed. Okay. Thank you very much. Zelma. And uh, in looking at these promises that God gave to Abraham, we can be sure that Abraham didn't understand nor comprehend the full extent of the promises that God gave to him or why those things were. He didn't understand why God told him to leave his country. Even God told him that he was going to bless him. He didn't understand why. And thank God he didn't start to ask God, but why? Why do I have to move? Why do I have to go here or there? That's the same with us. And I, I remember Brother Bill McKibben's testimony about uh, uh, some years back about his truck when he was in Los Angeles that his truck was stolen. And I remember vividly that he said, he, he told God while he was praying that God is your truck. But he didn't know at the time what God was preparing him for. That God was giving him certain things in his heart that were making him just a little bit restless just to push on to do certain things, especially with uh, uh, with regard to the work in, in Asia at the time. He didn't know why those things were happening. He didn't know that what today will be. And the same thing will be with you and myself. I know my story. When in 1991, God told me that some things were going to happen in my life that he wanted me to be a full-timer. I wasn't a full-timer. I didn't write an application. How was that going to happen? I didn't know what God was getting at. And then God started to move mountains. He started to walk. And here I am. So when God wants to do something in our lives, we may not know the reason why God wants to do it. And it is not our business, really, 
to start asking questions. Asking God questions is an indication that we are not really fully prepared to do his will. If we submit completely to him, God's purpose will be fulfilled and we'll be thankful and we'll see how great a mighty thing God has done through what he has allowed to happen in our lives. Question number five. Brother Daya Keju from Washington DC will help us with that. And the question is, when Abraham was 99 years old, God told him to walk before me and be thou perfect. Explain in your own words what this means. Why did God require this of Abraham? See Genesis 17.2. And Genesis 17.2 says, and I will make my covenant between me and thee, and will multiply thee exceedingly. Brother Dyer. Amen. Thank you, Brother Sam. This is a really good question. And um, I'll explain in my own way. That it's interesting to note that God called Abram at three different occasions after uh, he departed out of the land of Haran. Abram was 75 year, years old at the time when he left Haran to sojourn to a country, a faraway country that God called him to. So I'm not going to read those verses where God had a different calling on Abram's life, but I will point out in chapter 12, verse 7, uh, if you skip down to chapter 13, verses 14 and 15, and again in uh, verse 17, same chapter of 13. And then we read in chapter 17, verse 1, and I'm going to read from verse 1 to 5. And it reads like this, And when Abram was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. And I will make my covenant between me and thee and will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abraham fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be called Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made thee. So I think it's safe to assume that God called Abraham on three different, uh, separate occasions, and at each occasion, Abram learned to hear and to have gotten to know God more intimately. 25 or so years later, we read that after he left Haran, we read in verse uh, in chapter 17 that a, a call for a perfect walk was even more distinct and more unique than the previous walk. And the word... Uh, use of the word perfect here should be differentiated in two ways, right? One being that perfect in itself is God's nature. God is perfect in his own way. God who is perfect in every sin, and this is made clear throughout the word of God. We learn from the previous lesson in this quarter that God created the heaven and the earth, and God called, called, called his uh, creation, it was good. In other words, it was perfect. So God is perfect. And, and so when God called Abraham to walk with a perfection in mind, that didn't necessarily mean to me being perfect in the human sense of person or in living a life that is totally perfect as a human being, but rather perfect as one who is complete, as we call it today, complete in Christ Jesus. And Abraham fulfilled that same sense of completeness by exercising faith in God. A walk that meant there would be no disturbance, no division between himself and God. And it, but it took some time for Abraham to learn that faith walk. So today, we also have to walk that, uh, learn that same of, of faith, walking in faith. But we know that Adam fell as a result of disobedience and we inherit that from Adam that's why we are not perfect. We only made perfect through our Lord Jesus Christ when we come before him. We are not perfect, but we can be complete. Complete in God's eyes. I will look up the word um, 
perfect. And in the ancient Hebrew, the word perfect is equivalent to the word uh, wholeness. And some, it means that someone or something that is whole, uh, wholeness, a complete or full, one who is mature and upright, and one who is whole. So at justification or our salvation, we are pronounced as if though we are innocent before God, but we aren't in any way innocent before God, but God made us innocent in his eye uh, through our salvation in Christ Jesus. So by exercising the same kind of faith that Abraham exercised with God, so we today exercise the same faith by coming to Jesus and acknowledging our Adamic sin nature and bring them before God and before the uh, cross for forgiveness. So at the same time, we should be also recognized that we human are subject to making mistake, making error, or making a wrong decision, but God enables us to walk in completeness and walk in him through experiences. Why? Because just as God Abraham, uh, required Abraham to walk in unity with him, the Lord expects us today to walk in that perfect unity with Christ Jesus. And he is the only one that makes us to walk in that perfect unity with God. So I think that's the requirement for us today since Abraham time. Thank you. Thank you, brother. And um, that actually is very good. And it brings to mind the distinction between sinless perfection and absolute perfection. Uh, like Brother was talking about it, absolute perfection is the absence of anything that is not perfect. Everything has to be perfect. Your whole self, everything, your, the life, the circumstances, whatsoever. But that is not what God is requiring. That God, God requires that means that we walk in complete alignment with the requirements of God. That means we walk a way that we are completely perfect as far as not getting into sin is concerned. Yeah, as human beings, even when we are saved, we are sanctified, baptized, and all of that, we can still make mistakes. We can make errors. We can have oversight. But it is also very important to know that because we can have those things, they are not alibis for sinfulness. Sin is not a mistake. A person cannot categorize everything that he does, even when it is contrary to the word of God, and categorize it as an error or a mistake or an oversight. It is not an oversight to hate my brother or my sister. It is not a mistake to be engaged in fornication or adultery. It is not an oversight to practice racism. That is not an oversight, it's not a mistake. It's a sin, that is what God labels it as. And we have to make sure that we do not make distinctions of what God didn't make distinctions of, and also not make distinctions of what God already has made distinctions of. So God has taken care of all of those things that if we have perfect obedience to God, then we will be perfect in a seamless way before God. And God also has uh, uh, enabled us, he's cushioned us with two very powerful things. That is the imparted righteousness and imputed righteousness. When we lack 
the power on our own of even that imparted righteousness that God already has given us, which is so powerful, God, through Jesus Christ, has given us his own righteousness. And when we put on that righteousness of Christ, it nullifies, takes us away from all of those things. That is why someone like Sister Crawford, someone like uh, Brother Timothy, were able to live life that were completely opposite to the type of life that they were living before. That was why Paul was able to live the kind of life that he was living that was completely opposite his life before he was saved. And God wants us to be perfect. He expected it of Abraham, and he expects the same thing of us even today. Question number seven. Sister Foloke Adinakon from Langley, BC, will help us with that. And the question is, what significance is there in the fact that God changed Abraham's name to Abraham? Sister Foloke. Thank you very much. Now, the change of name, can you hear me, please? Yes, very well, Sister. Yeah. The change of name from Abraham to Abraham is a token of solemn covenants between God and Abraham in order to establish and confirm the faith of Abraham. This happens to be the first recorded example in the Bible where God changed a person's name. Uh, this change of name is quite different from the regular change of name we normally have. Like when we get married, we have change of name. Or for one reason or the other, we may have reasons to change our names. But this change of name is divine from above. At this point in time, Abraham was childless. Yet, the meaning of his name, Abraham, means a high father or exalted father. But now, God wanted to give him numerous children in order to establish the covenant between him and God. God changed his name from Abraham, exalted father, the to Abraham, which means father of multitude. Now, in order to bring it home, God also confirms his promises to us today in many ways, especially when we are seeking earnestly from God a particular blessing. Uh, God confirms his promise to us through the inspired word of God as uh, written in 2 Timothy 3.16. All scriptures is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. God also confirms his promise to us through the spirit of God leading us and bearing witness in our heart with our spirit and confirming his promise. So uh, it's also recorded in Romans 8, 14 and 16. For as many as are led by the spirit of God, they are the sons of God. The spirit itself beareth witness with us that we are children of God. Finally, God confirms his promise to us through God himself speaking to us directly. As we read in John 10, 27, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. Thank you very much, sir. Over to you, Brassam. Thank you, Sister Foluke. And... Um... You know, Sister Fulke had uh, her landmark, a landmark birthday yesterday. So on behalf of all of us, happy birthday to you in, uh, in Arias. Thank you very much, sir. And uh, also we had that uh, beautiful song 
at the start of this lesson, Father Abraham, no name has significance. And as Sister Fuloke said, the Lord changed Abraham's name to signify the dawn of a new era for him, that God was going to fulfill what he promised him. This was a very sweeping promise that God gave him. And we see that uh, this is not the only time that God will do that. Later on, Abraham's grandson, Jacob, had a change of name. And God promised that you and myself and everybody else that believes and serves him and trusts in him and is his child, that he will give each one of us a new name that nobody else will know but him alone and the person that will, will have the name, of course, uh, later on. So this shows the pattern. Sometimes God will show us a pattern of what he's going to do in the future. Just as we see in the lap of Elijah and Enoch, how uh, God translated and caught up uh, Elijah to, to heaven to signify what is going to happen later on down the ages. And this is the same type of thing. And to get a confirmation from God, sometimes when God promises us something, it's usually too big for us. And we wonder how that will happen. And many times we want to, we want to get a confirmation just to be sure, am I really thinking all right, is this, is this so what God has told me? We want to know those things, we want a confirmation. And just like Sister Fulke mentioned, the greatest way to know from God, to get a confirmation from God, is to know his voice, to know the voice of God. The confirmation, it shouldn't come from somebody else. It needs to come from God, first and foremost. And when we hear from God, we know that the scriptures will confirm that. But what God promises us sometimes is only personal for us. But I Bill is not going to find something about his truck in the Bible. You may not find something in particular that God is telling you in the Bible or me exactly in the Bible. But God told us, God spoke to us when we got saved. And as we walk closer with God, God will speak to us. God speaks. And when God speaks and we understand, we know his voice, that is a confirmation. We don't need somebody else, really, if we are truly working with God, to make that confirmation with us. Actually, Sister Crawford mentioned in her testimony that after she got saved, she wanted and she got sanctified, she, she was really wanting the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And she was longing for it. She was hungering terribly for it. And she will meet preachers that will come, that will, she will come across, that will come to visit and wherever she visited, uh, talking with them. And they will tell her, oh yeah, you, you, you already, you already fine, you already, you already say, you already stand, you, you, you already have the spirit. But she said she knew she didn't have it. But they were trying to confirm to her something that was contrary to what God was telling her. And in, uh, in, in confirmation, God even said that if God told us something and then we seek another person's confirmation, like uh, uh, a, a prophet, God said that he's going to give us something contrary to what he was saying, just paraphrasing, because we should know his voice. We should know the voice of God, because God does speak. Abraham later on, when God told him to go and, and uh, sacrifice his son, that was a terrible thing in the light of that it's only the heathens that will sacrifice their kids. But he knew it was the voice of God. He knew it was the same voice that spoke to him when he said he should leave his country. 
and Abraham obeyed. He didn't even consult with his wife because he knew it was the voice of God. It is important for us to know and be able to distinct, uh, distinguish between the voice of God and other voices. The Bible says that my, my sheep know my voice and they follow me. That is one of the qualities of a Christian, of a child of God. A child knows his father's voice. We have to know the voice of God when God is talking to us. We have to be able to know that this is God's voice and this is not the, the voice of God. Whoever is speaking, whosoever, we should be able to know that in everything. And that is what the foundation that Abraham has given to us. Question number nine, Sister Tola Desope from Pullman, Washington will help us with that. The question is, it is obvious that Abraham received some wonderful benefits by following the Lord. In reading Psalm 1, we find some benefits to which we too have access if we follow the Lord. The first verse of this Psalm lists three contingencies for each, give an example or illustration applicable to our day. Sister Tolu. Thank you very much, sir. Um, uh, the three contingencies in the, in the first verse, they are, walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Uh, Daniel chapter 1 verse 8 says that Daniel proposed in his heart that he will not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. So an illustration that's applicable to our day is, uh, for example, as children of God, we are not to defile our bodies with alcohol or drugs. So for a child of God to be working with ungodly and seeking their counsel about taking drugs or alcohol can be very disastrous. They will try to persuade such a child of God and give reasons why he should indulge in such acts. So if, a, if such a child of God is not careful, it will stand to discuss more with them. And from there, it could be persuaded to go to the bar or their house, sit down with them, to try a sip or a cup of alcohol and defile his body. Daniel did not seek the counsel of the ungodly when he was offered to eat the king's meat. If he had done that, maybe he would have been advised otherwise. But he took his stand for what was right and God honored him. He feared better than those who ate the king's meat after 10 days. And the second Corinthians chapter six verse 17 says that we should come from among them just like Abraham did, and be separate. We walk and go to school with unbelievers, and that does not mean we should quit going to work or going to school, but the Bible wants us to be separate and not to be indulged in their behavior, their acts, or their way of life. If we separate ourselves from all this and uh, we obey God's commandments just like Abraham did, God will bless us just as he blessed Abraham in this world and in the world to come. So may God please help us to separate ourselves from things that might interfere with whatever God uh, calls us to do and God will bless us immensely for that. That's my contribution, sir. Thank you, Sister Tolu. Very, very good. Uh, yes, this stresses, as Sister Tolu said, the importance of living. God expects us to live and to live for good. It may not be physical in, 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 in some situations as was the case with Abraham, but even if we are not living physically, God wants us to live emotionally. He wants us to live psychologically. He wants us to live spiritually that situation, to live that completely behind. If a person is living in the family where maybe the, the, the parents are not saved or the, uh, the children are not saved or something, you don't have to leave that, that environment physically 
but you have to live mentally. You have to live. Your, your whole being has to live. You cannot really, uh, uh, you can be in sync with them in the same way that they are or that you were with them before. And uh, this, we see the significance of this, even in Abraham's life, after Abraham left Aaron and was in, uh, uh, he was walking towards, towards uh, Canaan. And not long after he got there, there was famine in the land. God knew that there was going to be famine there, but God took him there. And Abraham didn't say, well, maybe God made a mistake to lead me into this place. Now there is famine. What am I doing here? I need to go back to my place. He didn't go back there. When he left, he left for good. And we pray that God will help us not to go back to where we were before God called us out of the life of sin. If we live completely, if we live totally, that will reflect on our lives. And the more we separate from the world, the more we be in alignment with God. No wonder the Bible calls, calls Abraham the friend of God. For a man to be a friend of God, just because Abraham aligned himself completely with God. Abraham was a good man. He, he was an amazing man in the way that he walked with God. He did an amazing thing. And God honored him because he left totally. And our last question is question number 10. And uh, Brother George Willano from Langley, BC will help with that. The question is Psalm 1 uh, verse 3 promises the godly man that whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. How can we explain this verse in light of the fact that obviously all Christians are not materially prosperous? Brother George. Thank you, sir. Uh, Psalm 1 verse 3 says, And it shall be like a, a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth its fruit in a season. Its leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Uh, that prosperity does not necessarily mean uh, material prosperity. Uh, because uh, if we look at 3 John uh, 2, the Bible says, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health even as thy soul prospered. We can see that that blessing is conditioned uh, on the prosperity of our soul. Also, if we look at James chapter 2, verse 5, uh, there James was telling, he says, Hacking my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world rich in faith? and heirs of the kingdom, which he had promised to them that love him. We can see these are Christians that God says they are rich in faith, but yet they are poor materially in this world. And that's why in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 5 and 6, we are warned to be careful of assuming uh, prosperity to mean godliness. The Bible says in verse 5 and 6, it says, perverse disputings of men of of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness. It says, from such withdraw thyself. So gain is not godliness. It says in verse six, but godliness with contentment is great gain. And that's why we are further uh, admonished in John, in Saint, sorry, in Saint Matthew chapter six, verse 33, that we should seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. So the, the most important thing uh, is the prosperity of our souls. And then is the prerogative of God, whether he chooses to bless or uh, whichever way he likes, God can bless us. And uh, in Mark 8, 36, the Bible says, For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Again, just emphasizing that he, God can bless us materially, but the most important thing, if we're going to make heaven at last, is the prosperity of our soul. That's my contribution, sir. Thank you very much, Brother George. So we see that uh, this prosperity that God is talking about is not of 
this world really, it's possible that God may bless us with things of this world, that's fine. But even if we don't have it, it's still okay. God will get, he will get us through. God says that if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. If we have everything and it's only limited to this world, that avails nothing. So God wants us to be prosperous in him. And when we are his child, then definitely we have prosperity infinitum. We have it forever. God already has that plan. It is already in the things that God has allotted to each one of us, to each one of his children. And God also tells us in Matthew 6, 33, that seek you for the kingdom um, of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. All of the things, no matter what they may be, God even says that eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, it has not even entered into the mind of mankind, the things that God has prepared for his children, those that walk like Abraham, that walk in the spirit of Abraham, that walk in the path of Abraham, in the path of faith. And that is what God has called us to. And we thank God that we have uh, heard his voice and we have accepted it and we are walking there. And we pray that God will help us to continue to walk in that path until the very end as Abraham did so that we can see him face to face and have all of those promises that he has for his children among which we are numbered today. Well, thank you very much for the contributions and for a very wonderful discussion. And we pray that uh, the Lord will continue to bless us together. Amen. Brother Shola, over to you. Amen. Thank you so very much, Brother Sam. What a beautiful lesson the Lord has put before us this morning. We thank God for the lesson and, and uh, the lessons that we have taken in. They will help us in the days to come, in Jesus' name. Um, we are going to have Brother Zacchaeus Oyedokun from uh, Namibia, um, Africa, pray for us. Thank you so much, uh, Brother O. Let us pray. We thank you, O oh Lord, that we can gather together to worship you in spirit and in truth all across the world. It's in fulfillment of your promise that the time is now when true worshipers may have to worship you not in one location, but all across at the same time. We thank you so much. It's your love. May your name be glorified. We thank you for this lesson that is alive all the time we hear about the call of Abraham and how he cooperated with you. It's always alive. And we thank you that this call is not limited to Abraham. God is calling everybody today. Yes. And we trust, oh God, that all of us will answer completely. Amen. Even when Abraham got to the physical land, he knew there was something beyond the physical land. Mm -hmm. We have been saved. We've been sanctified and baptized, and you've blessed us in many ways, but we know there's something beyond what we're enjoying now. Mm. He was looking for the city whose builder and maker is God. Mm. Our prayer is, oh Lord, is that those of us who have answered this call, call may we continue to look for that city whose builder and, uh, whose builder and uh, maker and builder is God. Help us to keep ourselves in tune with the rapture. For the trumpet shall sound and we shall be able to see you as you are. Blessed be your name. And for those who have not yet answered the primary call, you have called and you are waiting. All this are ready. We pray, oh God, that you will help them to cooperate with you. Amen. For all things that you, they need to, to, to perfect them is available with you. Amen. We give all the glory. Amen. Not only we have listened to this now, I know this is going to be is 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 a, is a permanent record. Others will listen to it on on the Facebook. 
in perpetuity. Just as you gave the blessing to Abraham in perpetuity, we know that your blessing is on these teachings in perpetuity. That yes. any time, anywhere, anybody will listen to it. the same anointing, the same blessing that descended yes. during this time, we also follow and yes. give, produce the same fruit and result, which is answering the call of God and yes. staying faithful to God to the end of our life. We thank you so much. Accept our thanks, Lord, in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. 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 Thank you so very much, everyone. God bless you. Have a beautiful Sunday. Thank you. God thank bless you. Amen. Thank you, so thank you. Thank you. Bless you, Brother Tom. Thank you. Bye, Brother Mark. Thank you. Bless you, Brother Mark. Bye. 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 God bless everyone. Sister Zelma. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.